to the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my fingers in the mark on his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut, but Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hand, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. This is the reading of the word. Thanks be to God. So it's almost been a year since I last preached on this scriptural message and played that provoking song, Doubting Thomas. It was one of my first sermons here. The Doubting Thomas is that image that we tend to dwell on when we read this passage of scripture. We recognize and resonate, and perhaps with Thomas's doubt and uncertainty, we see the need in ourselves for that tangible evidence, right? We read this and focus on the second part and tend to just kind of gloss over the first part when Jesus first meets again with his disciples in the very upper room he had met with them to have the Last Supper before he died on the cross. Those disciples, though, are also doubting just as much as Thomas did. You see, it's important to note when this event occurs in our timeline of Jesus' life. This is after he had risen from the dead. This is after dying of a horrifying death by crucifixion. After he had been turned over by one of their very own to the authorities. The disciples are again gathered with their Lord, but this gathering is very different from that first gathering. The disciples who have gathered were not there when they crucified their Lord. They had hidden, scattered, ran, or even denied knowing Jesus. They weren't there to watch him nailed to the tree or tormented by mockers. And they were not there to have heard his final words of forgiveness. I don't know, but I'm going to assume that most of you do not watch or have not watched How I Met Your Mother. Or who has, because it's awesome. If you have not, you need to. <laughs> but in one of the season's episodes, Marshall, who's one of the main characters, loses his father. And the entire funeral begins to revolve around the last words spoken to each of the family members. And Marshall frets because the last words of his father were not some profound words of wisdom. Or some special moment like his other family members had. You know, we all think back, we can relate to this, right? The concept of last words is profound in our lives if we sit there and dwell on it too much. Or it can be devastating in our lives if we sit there and dwell on it too much. We can all relate if we consider the loved ones we have lost and some of us even live with that extreme amount of guilt, do we not? 
But consider this in light of the disciples and what they must be experiencing and feeling. Jesus' last words to most of them were in the very room in which they sat. The most profound of which were that his body was broken for them and his blood was shed for them. Then he went on to die a horrible death and although the women had said he had risen, they had yet to see him. All they knew was his grave was empty. But suddenly the Lord appears before them and says, Peace be with you. Which is a customary greeting. He then shows them his hands and his side, and then he says it again. He says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Peace be with you. <coughs> to say it again, after already having said it, means something is there behind Christ's words. You know, the gospel writers didn't write, they didn't sit there with a pen and paper recording every single thing that Jesus said. So anything that we read when we read through the gospels is important to the memory of those who read and wrote it. So Christ's words meant something to his fearful and distraught disciples. He is literally offering them forgiveness and trust again. You can almost sense the change that would have been in the room upon that second time of saying those words. He offers them peace for all their thoughts and doubts of what they have been called by Jesus to do. Because that's the crux of it. Their leader had not just left to go to another position. He was brutally killed for the very reasons he had called them to follow him. Would you not too be confused and doubtful <coughs> if everything you had been doing and were believing in or trying to believe in up to this point was suddenly wiped away? Jesus' death and the betrayal of Judas to make it happen was a very nasty pull of the rug out from underneath the disciples' collective feet. Their very foundation had been unceremoniously ripped out, and they're probably in good conscience going, what do we believe in now? Who do we believe in now? Who do we follow now? You see, we inherently in our faith feel an immense amount of guilt for asking God why. For a lot of reasons, we struggle to accept that in a relationship it is okay to ask why of one another. It's okay to question. It's okay to doubt. And this is some of what this scripture is saying to us as we delve further into interpretation and understanding. Because in the end, Christ says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. He, the risen Christ, says, let your fears and your doubts be at peace. One scholar puts it best in how Christ is in this passage. I, on my side, Christ would say, am proving that your doubts of me are ungenerous and wrong, and I want you to know that whatever you have done, and whatever you have been, I still trust you, and I still believe in you. And I want you to take it that God's love is big enough to cover you, to cover your needs, your sin, and God's power is strong enough to lift you up above all of that. And I want you to accept and to walk in the sunshine of God's forgiving grace forever. To look at it another way, Paul reminds us in Romans 5, 1, to have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Once we have accepted the peace that comes with acknowledging the forgiving grace of God, we are able to move forward and be sent with the necessary tools of our trade. And did you not know? We have one tool given to us that makes all things possible. We've heard it time and time again, right? You can almost say it with me. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. It's a common slogan and reminder because it is the gospel truth, right? We're reading in the Gospel of John. You see, Christ has said, even so I send you, and then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We don't always talk about the profound nature of the Holy Spirit, except around Pentecost. But this here is what we need to remember. <clears throat> it's the biggest, the best, the Swiss Army Deluxe model of tools in our toolkits. And it's the only tool we need. Christ sends me. He sends you. He sends each of us, not alone, because he does not ask us to do the impossible. Because recall that for many of us who believe and, and share in our faith, it seems an impossible task to share it outside of ourselves and outside of our church walls. And it seems an impossible task, particularly with how we almost have to keep our faith locked inside, right? Otherwise, the world will persecute us and call us out to be followers of Christ or call us out to be hypocrites in our faith and our beliefs because not everyone believes the same thing or sees Christ in the same way. Those disciples certainly had it tough, did they not hidden behind the locked doors of the upper room? But Christ sent them out. And he sends us out the profound power of the Holy Spirit in our arsenal. Because the Holy Spirit, my friends, is a representation of God and Jesus present within us. We have with our faith and our acceptance of our belief a representation of God, a part of God, a part of Christ within us. With God, truly all things are possible. Alone we cannot be sent forth, but with Christ we can do anything. Pray with me. Gracious Lord, send us. Send us beyond these doors, beyond the locked doors of our mind and of whatever walls we have built to hold our faith in. Help us to trust in the power of the Spirit that is the guide you have blessed us with. Help us to continue to put our trust and our faith in you. Help us, Lord, to acknowledge in our hearts that with you, your Son, and your Spirit, all things are truly possible when we believe. Amen. Amen.